Hello, it's Jeannie. How are you? I hope you're well. Today's video is the book review for September. And I know it's October 2nd today when I'm posting this because I'm just running so behind on things. Um, we got home from England, as you know, maybe, and then we were home a couple days and immediately flew out to California for um, actually a surprise. Uh, our son is going, uh, not our son, our grandson is going into the Air Force. And so, yeah, he's 19. And so he had a going away party and he doesn't go for a little bit yet, but we surprised him and showed up for that. And surprised my mom, because we didn't tell her we were coming, and so she was really excited. And, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, we got back late, and it's just been going, going, going. I know I have lots of emails that I haven't answered from some of you, and messages in my inbox. Sometimes it's just a quick word of yes or thank you. Or, and you know me, more, I'm usually more effusive with, you know, what I say, but I, I just haven't had the time. So I apologize for those who have been waiting on responses from me. I'll get there. I'll get there. But um, I, I appreciate them. I appreciate the love. I appreciate, you know, people who check in on me and all that. It's just, it's a lot. There are a lot. And so I kind of have to tackle it just a bite at a time. But keep it up because I just love y'all. I made a cup of tea to do this review by. And it is the tea that Kim from Angel on My Shoulder, my very dear friend Kim, I just adore her, um, sent me. And this is peaches and cream. And in this packet, it's loose leaf tea. And so there is enough here for three. So thanks, Kim. I've been busting into this stuff. So I have it here. I'm going, ooh, do you see the steam? Can you see that steam? It's hot. You know, I'm also going to set the mood and light the candle, she said. Spiced woods. Okay. Some of you know I'm not very good at lighting matches, but I'll do it away from the microphone. this book review as ASMR-ish as I can, because that's my channel. I could do it more like a, what do you call it, a pod, podcast in regular voice, then it's not as soothing, and I feel like with this, at least, you could turn it on, tune out, not listen to anything about it, and just fall asleep. 
because I was thinking back to what I first needed ASMR for, and it was exactly that. Just the blah, 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 blah in the background. That didn't hold a huge interest for me, so I could just fall asleep. And some of you know this story, but I used to listen to the radio, like talk radio, but with the commercials that come on, they're loud and they're obnoxious and And it was late night radio, so like George Norrie, <laughs> who I love, but some of that stuff was scary, so I couldn't sleep. I don't like scary at night. And even during the day, I, I just don't want to invite scary into my life. I've done that before, and I don't do well with scary. I think it knocks us off balance. There's enough scary stuff in the world anyway. So I don't need any more of it. And all I want to do is spread calm on my channel. Just on my little channel, me going blah, blah, blah to you and hoping you can find some peace with that. All right, Kim, I'm going to put your candle over there so I don't start something on fire because that wouldn't be very ASMR-ish, would it? <laughs> but it wouldn't be something completely out of character for me. Okay, now, let me taste this. Ooh, it's still hot. Mmm, that's so good. That's so good, but it needs to cool. Peaches and cream. It's made with China white tea and peach. All right. I have two pairs of glasses here because I was, oh, three, look. <laughs> Sorry, that's not very ASMR-ish. I have three pairs of glasses. Let's see which one <laughs> um, reflects the least. No. Okay, let's try my regular. I think those will be best. <laughs> Three pair, Janie. Okay, I have some notes here. The book is The Tattooist of Auschwitz. Now, as books go, I would not have picked this out. And I'll tell you why. I don't like visiting this era. I just don't. And it's hard to explain, but I, uh, I just don't want to feel bad when I read a book. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I, I just, yeah, some of them I have found have been so upsetting and sad, and yet it's a story we need to remember. Now, the tattooist of Auschwitz, at its core, is a love story amidst trials and tribulations and a horrible, ugly time in our history. Now, I'm going to stop right here and tell you. I give away everything when I do this review. So if you think you want to read it and not find out, you know, the plot or the ending or anything, don't watch this, okay? I'm warning you. But basically, I'm going to go through it and tell you about it and my thoughts about it. And so, 
what I, sometimes I can be a little dense. I didn't realize this was basically a true story. The author interviewed this man over a period of three years and basically got this story out of him. And, you know, there had, I guess there was, there was some controversy about accuracies. Well, in times of stress, sometimes details can get fuzzy. I get that, and I'm not going to hold that against the story. Um, but anyway, let's, let's get into it. The Tattooist of Auschwitz. And I think just by the name, I think you understand that the tattooing they meant was the, the number on the arm. So it's April it's 1942, and the main character, Lalo, Lelo, is a Slovakian Jew. And he has heard that the government is asking families to send a son over 18 for, their, for the work camps. Voluntary, voluntarily send someone. And so he said, Mom, Dad, I'll go not knowing what he was getting into. So he gets on this train and takes this long train ride and ends up basically at Auschwitz. And they began sorting and identifying, you know, um, all the people coming in and he gets, you know, his own number tattooed onto his arm. You know, they're stripped of their clothes, their heads are shaved, they're showered, you know, and he had books and money in his coat. That's gone. And I'm, there were a lot of people who hid things in their clothing thinking they'd need them. They, they lost all that. So he is taken to his bunk, bunk, um, like uh, housing, you know, his housing unit, number block seven in Birkenau. And um, he meets his roommates and strikes up a friendship with one of them over their weak, you know, uh, watery soup. And that, and that, and his name was Aaron. Anyway, he goes out to a ditch nearby his block, his bunker area, to go to the bathroom. And he sees three guys out there squatting, and some SS guards come by and just for no reason at all shoot them. Well, he manages to hide and not get shot. Had he been out there a minute earlier, he would have been shot. But he vows at that time he is going to live through this. And so that is his commitment. He's going to get through this somehow. So he starts off his first job working with some Russians, uh, doing some roof building um, on some buildings. And he's very versed in many languages, so he's able to speak with them. And he kind of gets to know these guys. Well, one day, while he is working with them, he sees this prisoner get shot. And it affected him so much, he passed out. Well, it turns out he was sick. He had typhus. And so they you know, took him back into his room and his bunk and they, he was basically going to be tossed into the cart where they take away very sick people and, you know, exterminate them. But somebody pulled his body off, hid him and actually nursed him with their own meager rations of food and they brought him back. So he wakes up a few days later and doesn't know where he is or what's going on. But, you know, thanks to that bunkmate, um, Aaron, you know, he saved his life. 
Well, when he woke up, and you know, it was several days later, this guy, Peplin, saw this and thought he must be a special guy for someone to have risked their lives to save him. So he was really intrigued by this. Well, he was the main tattooist at that time. And so Lilo, um, he asked him to be his assistant. And so that became his new job, the assistant tattooist. And begins tattooing prisoners with him. And he also learns at that time that Aaron, his bunkmate, was killed because he had tried, you know, protecting him and saving him. And so he, uh, Lelo, also vows that he is going to do everything he can to repay and help others. So, a new group of prisoners come in, and it's a group of women. And Lelo says, I can't do this to a woman. And he is reminded, if you don't, someone else will, and you won't have this job. So he does. And as he's doing it, this one woman, he's doing her arm, one of the SS come over, and he takes her face, and he's looking at her, and he says something, and she is going to say something back, which would probably get her killed. But Lelo squeezes her arm and says, you know, in with his eyes, don't do it. And so she was quiet. And it was probably that that saved her life. So here she is, her head is shaved, and, you know, she's getting her tattoo. But she and Lalo look at each other, and, and you kind of know this is it for him and her. And, you know, they smile at each other. And it was that smile that just uplifted him. And so she's on his mind for the most part from now on. Her name is Gita. And she doesn't tell him right away. All he knows is her number. Anyway, Pepin, the main tattooist, disappears, which people do there. And Beretsky, the SS officer, asks Lelo to be the head tattoo artist. Tattoo ver um, what is the name? I wrote it down. Um Yeah, Tattoo Viera. And at first he doesn't want to, but then he realizes, you know, it's a job and he will be gentle with people. He's not going to be unkind and he's going to find ways to be gentle and this could be his way. So he's working with this kind of young punk, Beretsky, the officer, and kind of getting to know him a bit. He has a new assistant named Leon and also begins to use this relationship, this this banter that he have, he and Beretsky have to find out more about Gita, who again he doesn't know her name, just her number. And he asks a favor, can you go to her and ask her to meet me? This Sunday, you know, when he has his day off. And this guy, Beretsky, did, but he said, you owe me a favor, which is kind of scary. But anyway, he does. He ends up meeting her by one of the buildings and kind of starts getting to know her and finds out that her name is Gita, but she wouldn't give her last name. So because Lalo is now the head tattooist. He is in a different block, and he actually gets more food. Now, you think he would be eating that food, but he doesn't do that. He saves it, and he divides it among his bunkmates and others who need it more than him. And 
so you start seeing his generosity right away. On one of his days off, he's walking around and he sees these two guys working on a building, building something, some big structure, and their names are Victor and Yuri. And he starts chatting with them, and Victor reaches into his bag and gives him some sausage, which was so kind. And again, instead of eating it, he takes it back and he shares it with the others. But he tells Victor, I will pay you back, and I will thank you for your kindness. And he says, you don't have to do that, but Lalo wants to. So, there are women whose job it was to go through all the possessions that were confiscated from the prisoners. And so he bribes them with sausage and some other things that he's getting from Victor and Yuri to start giving him those things. And they mean nothing to these women. So diamonds and jewels and, you know, rubies and rings. And so he starts giving this to Victor. And Victor is an outside worker from like the local village. He's not a prisoner. And so now he's started this bartering relationship with Victor. And when he needs something, he, you know, he can pay diamonds for it, rings and jewels and gold. And so Victor is bringing him things. Um, and like chocolate and you know chocolate back then was a rare treat and so you know he is using chocolate to bribe some of the women to help him get closer to Gita um, to spend time with her um, and but again he's always sharing his food he doesn't use it for himself he's always giving it away and he becomes known for being generous and kind and saving lives. About that time, an American Jew happened to be, got, uh, to be caught up in that time and showed up for his tattooing. His name was Jacob, and he was a huge man. Um, and Lelo knew he would die if he didn't get extra rations because he was so big he needed more than the other, you know, prisoners, the standard ration. And so Lalo went out of his way to take care of him and he saved his life doing that. And that comes back to help him later on. So good karma, right? so good. Oh, Kim. Well, so this is going on. He's seeing Gita more, using, you know, and, and feeding the camp, sneaking in extra bites of sausage for them, giving them from Victor. You know, he gives these gals extra food. They give him the jewels, and he's got this whole economy going that is really saving lives. And now, at this time, Gita falls ill with typhus. And so he gets Victor to get some medicine. Now, if you're sick, it's very likely you will die or be given up to, you know, be killed because you're worthless. So he convinces them, you know, her bunkmates to hide her and feed her until he can get her medicine, which he does and saves her life. So this whole bartering system is really helping them. When she wakes up, she understands that she loves him you know, Gita loves Lalo too, and they start talking about a future, which, how can you in such bleak, bleak times? But they do, and that is each other's hope and driving force, is the love that they've found with each other. Well, as fate would have it, his mattress in his block got searched, and the jewels were found. 
and so he was escorted to another block where two SS officers interrogate him. Where did you get this stuff? Give us the names. And he wouldn't. He said, I don't know their names. So they said, okay. And the next day, the torturer comes in, and it's that big guy, Jacob. So remember, Lalo saved his life by giving him food. Well, his job now at the camp was beating the, and torturing the other prisoners for the SS to get information out of them. So he sees Lalo, and they have a few moments to talk, and he tells him, look, I have to beat you, but I'll make it look worse than it is. Don't give up the names. Take the beatings and then, you know, pass out. And that's, so the SS officers come in. Jacob gives him a, a, a beating, but it could be worse, but it isn't. Um, I mean, I'm sure he broke some ribs. He punched his face. He did what he had to do to make it look real. But Lalo did not give up the names of the women who were giving him the jewels. And so Jacob says to the SS officers, he, clearly he doesn't know who they are because this Jew is weak. He would have given them up if he, if he knew the names. So they retreat and, um, you know, he heals slowly, but with, you know, his surprise, to his surprise, he gets his job back as a tattooist. He goes back to Beretsky, who heard what happened. And um, he had even, the Beretsky, his SS, you know, overseer, had even tried to get um, Lalo to get him some nylons for his girlfriend, which he couldn't do because he got caught and, you know, that changed things. But anyway, so he's back tattooing again and chaos is starting to break out and he hears that the Russians are coming. And so they're starting to ship people off and disperse um, the prisoners. And it's one night he hears the, a big loud commotion going on and he goes out of his bunk and he sees the women are being bussed out. And he sees Gita and so he runs out and, you know, he's being pushed away and it's dark and he's, Gita, Gita. And it's crazy and she's crying. But the last thing she says to him, screaming to him, is her last name, Furman. I am Gita Furman. So he can look for her at least later. She, on one of the stops, manages to escape. And I think at this point now they're walking. They're like marching. And during a break, she and a couple other gals ran across a snowy field, which to me would leave tracks, but you know, it was a chaotic time, but they made it to some farmhouse and were taken in. And you know, some details you know, more details there, but basic, sh basically she catches a ride with another Slovakian uh, truck driver to take her back home. So she basically escapes and she does check in with the Red Cross when she gets back to Bratislava. So that's where it kind of ends with her. During this time, Lalo is put on a bus or a train and shipped off to Austria. He was dispersed and um, to an, a new concentration camp. And his passion now is finding Gita. That's his whole drive. He is shipped to a different camp in Vienna, but they told him the main guard there doesn't like Jews, so don't tell them that you're Jewish and you'll be okay. You know, it'll be easier for you. So he kind of, you know, they kind of befriended him and did him that favor. So he's shipped to this new 
camp. The director of this camp is really old and kind of easygoing, and so, you know, Lalo's got it pretty easy. Well, as he's walking around the fencing one day, he's just determined to find a loose post that he can get out of, and he does, and he takes off. He's out of there. He just starts walking, and he gets away, only to end up in the hands of the Russians. But again, so they capture him, but they're a bit kinder to him. And they feed him and, you know, bathe him and give him new clothes. But let him know, if you try to escape, we will kill you. They're also impressed with his language skills, that he can speak so many languages. So his new job is to go into the town, take these jewels that they account for, and go find girls to bring back for all the officers to have parties with. Well, so he starts doing that. He goes into the town, shows the girls these jewels, invites them back, and starts rounding up. You know, that's his job, just going to get the girls. And they, they know him, you know, and they go willingly because they're getting jewels. You know, it's a scratch my back and I'll scratch yours and you know they know what they have to do to get food and money and jewels to feed their own families. So one of these times the guard who is watching him do this you know who would take him into town to get the girls but keep his eye on him isn't there and he's trusted to go alone. Well he takes that opportunity to escape. You know, he first he steals a car, he goes as far as that will go, then he steals like a, a bike, the bike gets stolen, and then he pays a guy to take his horse and cart, and so he's on the run with his horse and cart, and he escapes to Slovakia. And he, is, he goes home, he meets up, he sees his sister, who's still living in their house, and she lets him know that not long after he left, his mom and their mom and dad were, were also taken and not heard from again. And he tells her, his sister, about Gita. And she says, what are you doing here? Go find her. And so he goes and he starts meeting the trains that are coming in with refugees. And he's asking women, have you seen Gita Furman? Have you seen Gita Furman? No, no, no. But have you checked with the Red Cross? So he said, no. So he and the horse and cart, I get chills at this part, are heading toward the Red Cross. And he sees three girls, women, walking toward him. And one of them is Gita. And he gets out and he just falls to the ground. And she comes up to him, and the other girls are saying, Is that him? Is that him? She said, Yes. Anyway, they embrace, and he asks her, Will you marry me? And of course she says, Yes. And, well, the war ends, but of course, as you know, you know, Slovakia is under, becomes Czechoslovakia under, you know, um, Soviet rule. But they started up a business um, importing fabrics and things like that and um, they did quite well and started making a lot of money and they were able to eat at fine restaurants and um, you know have a good life now, what they were doing with their a lot of their money was sending it to um, in support of setting up a Jewish state in Israel. But again, this was all in a smuggling capacity, and he had a partner. Um, Lalo did. They both did. Oh, and he changed his name, by the way, to Sokolov. Um, just after that was the married name of his sister's husband. So he changed to his last name to Sokolov. Anyway, his partner 
went through a divorce. His wife, out of spite, outed them for what they were doing and, you know, smug smuggling out this money. And, you know, so she was a rat and they got caught doing this. Well, after they were ratted out, their business was nationalized. In other words, it was taken over by the Czechoslovakian government. And he was sentenced to two years in prison. And, you know, for depriving Czechoslovakia of its wealth by sending it away. Well, they were smart enough to put aside a hidden stash. And because of that, and there's a lot of detail here, though, but while he was in prison, Gita was able to, to bribe some officials to get him out. And so, like on a temporary leave, because they thought he was going crazy. And so while he was out on his temporary leave, they escaped. And they were able to get on a truck and head to Vienna. And from Vienna, they went to Paris and lived in Paris. And then from Paris, they went to Australia. And lo and behold, which she never thought she could, especially after being so malnourished during the war, she actually got pregnant and they had a son. And so that is how it ends. And kind of a happily ever after. Um, now, would I recommend this book? Sure, I would. If, you know, you are interested in that kind of thing, you know, love story out of an, an extremely hard, hard time. So it was well done. The sad parts weren't too sad. The hard parts weren't too hard. It was done, I think, with some really good balance and and showing humanity, which I really appreciate on all sides. You know, the prisoners, some of the guards, the German guards, the Russians, um, the gypsies that would come into the camp because they were the lowest of the low, but they were really good at protecting their own and, and, and Lalo. And so there are, there are glimmers of good in it all, and that is what I like. So that is the Tattooist of Auschwitz. And um, I'm having trouble with my camera overheating, and I don't know why, which is why I have to do a lot of weird cuts, because it's blacking out. So, I will sign off for now, finish my tea, and get ready to plan my next video with you. I do like sitting down doing this because it is a time for me to be calm and centered. And it makes me take time to pause because I've been going a hundred miles an hour. So this feels good to just bring myself into this space here with you. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the story. Let me know if you're going to read it. Um, now that you know how it all goes. I hope this brought you some quiet, relaxing, blah, 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 if anything. And um, I appreciate you. Give me a thumbs up. It's good for the algorithm, if you would, please, if you've stuck around this long. And I will sign off for now. I appreciate you. I thank you. I wish you all well. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye for now. <laughs>